all those great statements that we say hey we are here to change the freaking world it's all bullshit you are here to make money you're here to help your customers you're here here to help your pc investors make money so i went and started asking for tips started fanboying over him and the first thing he said you know hey wingify is doing well you're a millionaire and you should dress like one <laughs> i clearly remember that the first set of sentences <laughs> He said to me at the fundamental core the belief is very simple build good products hang around good friends push your life to be more curious be kind to other people I mean which I had in my 20s where I felt I had something to prove to others I want to leave a legacy all those things have completely disappeared what I want to do is just have happy days one after another almost until the last moment entrepreneurs never are happy by default so your default state is unhappy with the current environment you're saying because I'm, I'm unhappy with the current environment I'm going to strive to make it better I'm interested in just a number of things and then very few of those things have to do with commercial consideration for example india has the capability and the skills to be able to deliver world class products and i think paras has also done great with his product as well so for me the drive is to be the best in the world uh, i think i'm very happy just buying a 500 rupees book uh, that's financial independence for me hi this is siddharth alwalia and welcome to the neon show today i have two brilliant guests with me one is first time around the show the other is making his second appearance after 2 years one is the co-founder of fusion charts why the other is the co-founder of wingify both equally resilient curious and stars of the saas ecosystem in india we welcome pallav nadhani and paras chopra on the neon show i would also like to thank our sponsors prime venture partners for sponsoring the neon show hope you enjoy it hi this is sadat welcome to the neon show today i have with me two brilliant guests some of the best saas entrepreneurs in india and they have built the saas ecosystem in the last 10 years in this episode we'll dive deep into their minds their thing then how do they actually you know believe in what their core thesis are at the basic pallav and paras welcome to the show thank you thank you so much sadat for having us here so pallav you have founded fusion charts you ran it for 10 years and uh paras wingify has been going on for almost i think 13 years yeah 13 years wow this has been a huge marathon for both of you right uh most people like uh in the west build companies and keep on selling it uh, right but for you both it has been like a life's mission so before i i dive into the serious stuff i want to you know you both have been very dear friends like best friends so want to go back to right what how did you both meet and what caused those friendship and uh, you know for our audience uh, uh pallav has been a very dear friend i have known paras for more than a year now and pallav uh, uh people love to party with you and uh, parav uh, paras is a serious person like me so nancy commented me like before the episode that uh, sadhar you are more serious than <laughs> so i'll take it as a compliment you should have been to my goa party <laughs> then you would have known <laughs> next year what your 27th yes. birthday yes for sure <laughs> Yeah. So one question is that uh, Fusion Charts have been running for 20 years actually. It's been two decades. Uh, on how I met Paris, I think we met uh, for 13 years ago. 2010. Yeah. I think I should tell that story. That's perfect. It was a NASCOM conference, I remember. Which year? I think this was 2012, 2011. 10 or 11, one of those years. Yeah, I was very soon after Wingify was just getting just started. And I was at the NASCOM conference. I think Pallav was uh, one of the panels. And... Um, had approached him because i mean he he had been bootstrapping and i've read about fusion charts read about pallav so had and still have a lot of admiration for him so i went and started asking for tips started fanboying over him and the first thing he said you know hey uh wingify is doing well you're a millionaire and you should dress like one <laughs> i clearly remember that's the first set of sentences he said to me and then just we just became very very natural friends i think we bonded over a number of things Uh, around our philosophy of companies around SaaS, I learned a lot from him. Uh, so what I observe from our differences, your core beliefs are same, but your personalities are very different. Yeah, I mean, um, I you just change over like <laughs> <laughs> you change over the year. No, no, <laughs> you have. <laughs> I've been the same all the time, Paras. <laughs> same for me. <laughs> But I think you are absolutely right. So I mean, from a core belief perspective, we believe in uh, like a uh, lot of times when you're talking, like believe in fundamentally making good products. we believe in making good organization this mostly on the work side we believe in uh, sort of pushing the boundaries of what we can do both at a personal level and on the professional level uh the places where we are different obviously i mean life takes you different like i have two kids uh paras is uh, uh living slightly more on the spiritual and the, on the healthier side 
I'm more on the party side. So those differences happen. But at the fundamental core, the belief is very simple. Uh, build good products. Hang around good friends. Push your life to be more curious. Be kind to other people. And a whole bunch of those things. And I think on those things, we fundamentally completely agree. On the manifestation of some of the uh, actions in your life, be it biases, be it other things, those will differ across uh, different people in different stages of life. Yeah, and I think it's good that um, like we both are not 100% alike. I think that's what keeps the fun going. Uh, I think there's always, uh, I mean, people, if they're sort of surprising each time you meet, I think that keeps things interesting. And I think that's the way I expect from our love wherein um, I think I'd get totally bored if I had a friend like myself. <laughs> so uh, it's good to have someone who's not like it's, me. It's been almost like 13 years of friendship. It has been that, yeah. yeah. And the fun part is just not me and Paras were friends. So my wife, Pooja, and Paras's wife, Akancha, who's a great artist, both of them are very good friends as well. So I think one thing we sort of also, which evolved very well for both of us, is we were able to sort of bring our family and our friends together and sort of create this ecosystem saying, hey, uh, what does a good life mean? How do we sort of uh, propel each other forward, whether it's in terms of intellectual curiosity, in terms of professional uh, achievement. And when you sort of put all these pieces together instead of isolating them, that personally, I think, has worked out very well for yeah. both of us. So me and my wife, Akansha, we're godparents of his kids and <laughs> and Pooja's kids. So very close to kids, very yeah. close to Pooja, of course, close to Pallav. And yeah, it's been a beautiful sort of friendship and relationship that we have got and going. You both meet each Friday, right? Uh, at not as often. So No, not as often, actually. Yeah. So I think, so I'll give you two answers to that. One, do I want to meet him every Friday? Probably no. Uh, also because each Friday for meeting, you don't have so much new things to be able to sort yeah. of, because he's running Ninti right now and he's going to be busy Monday to Friday on his thing. Uh, I would rather prefer to meet him, let's say, once every two weeks or three weeks. And then, because it's not just, hey, we meet and we just uh, gulp out a bunch of drinks. For us, most of the meetings are about, hey, we sit down, we talk about a whole bunch of topics across different spectra. In fact, that's one of the reasons we launched our own podcast, which was just a fun thing called, what the f- happened? And we said, whatever we discuss on a table on a Friday night, why don't we just expose it? Which was a conscious idea, actually, one of those nights. So if you keep meeting very frequently and you don't have like new things to discuss. So for example, me and Paris, I don't think we have a common physical manifestation of our relationship in the terms of a common sport that we play. Yeah. Like I love poker. And I think it's not like uh, like how you're friends with say your school friends or college friends. I think there is a healthy mix of professional respect. So um, so in that sense, it's a different kind of friendship than how would you hang out with, let's say, a school friend where it's just totally about, say, let's say, reliving the old memories. Yeah. But here is a lot of like you discuss about ideas, you discuss about technology and of course, you respect the other person as a friend also, but uh, it's slightly different from a college and a f- school friend, for example. And now I want to jump into more fun stuff. So what I'll do is and ask you a question. It's not rapid fire, uh, but you have to answer within one to one and a half minute. And sure. The, each question is for, uh, has to be answered by both of you. Who goes first? So so Pallav can uh, okay. go first. You're the elder sass one, so <laughs> he goes. No, for the first half of question, then the okay. second half of question you have to go. No. Okay. That's, <laughs> fair. That's fair now, yes. <laughs> so so what does pursuit of happiness mean to you? So I think happiness changes based on the stage in life. Uh, there's no fixed definition of happiness in my life. So when you're young, you want to have fun, you want to party, you want to have a set plan for the every weekend, go out and do that. When you're building company, happiness is about certain goals saying that, hey, I want to achieve this and that. And you tie your happiness to that. Let's say when I got married, my happiness was about traveling with my wife, uh, spending enough time with her. Uh, When I had kids, happiness has now changed to the construct of, hey, can I spend enough time with them? So from personal life, happiness is a constantly changing metric. But that should not be the goal because if you're constantly chasing just happiness and you've not sort of defined what happiness is and it's very freaking hard to define what happiness is you'll always be depressed. And that's the hedonistic treadmill a lot of people run on and I'm guilty of that as well. So for me, happiness right now is very importantly at a personal level, be comfortable with who I am. Uh, Even if I talk stupid, foolish in front of everybody, I know that this is who I am. I don't need to project somebody else to somebody and that gives you inner peace and happiness. Sort of those are combined. In a professional life, happiness is building things which I like to do. So uh, for me and this not coming from bootstrap world, but fundamentally I believe in uh, what feels like work to other people if it feels like play to you do that work because then your life is going to be very very enjoyable and avoid having too many guns to your head the more you have the freedom to do the things that you want to do and you enjoy it 
and you were able to sort of propel that forward that inherently is happiness and i know paris is a nihilist or at least was a nihilist very not anymore not anymore <laughs> So for me, happiness. I mean, coming from that construct back, for me, happiness is to live your life. We are all ephemeral creatures at the end of the world in a very philosophical construct. Uh, while a part of the world says go do the most ambitious thing in the world, a part of the world says life doesn't have meaning. Somewhere in the between, you have to find your own spectrum of happiness, and it's very, very subjective and con- uh, contextual in that overall uh, sense. Arush, what about you? Yeah, I mean, for me, happiness is being you know seven out of ten in all the domains. So. Um, I mean, usually we end up thinking, you know, a single source will give us happiness, and you end to overdo it. It could be anything in life. Uh, you could even overdo things like fitness. You could overdo being involved in relationships. You could overdo pursuit of money. And I think, uh, like the old saying goes, right? Excess of anything becomes sort of a poison. Um, yeah. So for me, happiness is shooting above median on most of the aspects that the old wisdom says gives you happiness, but not obsessing over them. So. it's you can imagine it to be like a healthier balance but on trying to be on the positive side and not being you know average on almost everything i think we need to get you more beer <laughs> the other is still not coming from the core yeah so oh, that's what i believe in so also one that uh, so a lot of times as and this probably from an entrepreneurial aspect we sort of define our happiness tied to a goal yeah if we hit a funding milestone or if we hit a revenue milestone or if we hit this big deal we are like hey we are always chasing a goal and more and more i think either it's a function of age or the way we bought uh like if you look at let's say the spiritual side of what teaches like find happiness in everything so now i'm forcing myself to sort of find happiness in the smallest things like with kids and that is sort of something which you normally don't realize before the kids uh that a normal smile or one naughty thing they do it gives you immense amount of happiness on a constant basis then you stop seeking that one big goal and the what you talk about the balance so it has to be balanced between the small uh what we call the dopamine rushes and the large goals that you're able to balance in between those i think evolutionarily speaking happiness is sort of like a signal that things are going well for you so by this definition no single thing can be a source of happiness because as soon as you try to over optimize it you know it just comes at a cost of neglecting something else so it just means that that healthy balance of multiple things if there is any source of happiness it can just be a balance of multiple things no single source will give you that the next one is what does entrepreneurship mean to you be a uh, be in control of your life most importantly the sub construct of that is the crux of entrepreneurship is two things build things people want sell it at more than what it costs and this is entrepreneurship and i'm not talking about where you're trying to change the world uh the whole construct around when we say entrepreneurship versus business it's i think it's sort of a fine line between that in like how do you sort of say is this a business a businessman or is this a entrepreneur you will say hey somebody who's trading is a businessman but somebody who's creating a new thing is a entrepreneur but if you look at some of the biggest businesses in the world they are basically market places they are trading so what is the fine line between that so in my mind entrepreneurship at the crux of it is hey i need to build something where i deliver value to people and i need to capture value out of that this is actually from paris's framework create value and capture value if you only create value and don't capture value uh you were just a uh, company was losing money or probably a hobby project so you are wikipedia you are <laughs> wiki linus torvalds they create value don't capture it lot of open source projects are about that right? i still have huge respect i was going to uh talk about a whole bunch of funded companies of no freaking idea how to really make money if the funding stops yeah. so you create value and you capture value and that's what on the pinership is about and the second thing about on the pinership is about uh are you having fun while doing it see uh, if you look at a trading business people are doing that day in and day out it's the same repeatable playbook and they are optimizing for certain things uh, let's say whether it's your credit policy or whether it's your working capital or whole bunch of things in entrepreneurship you're saying hey the number of dimensions that i can play on is infinite then i have to pick a dimension where i'm really really good at and that's where you drive an insight and you say i'm going to unlock that insight and build on top of that so uh, yeah it's just creating more value for customers creating more value for yourself for your team members and everybody else while having fun at doing it Arash. yeah for me it's uh, i think thinking and acting independently and in that sense uh, i would club a lot of uh, pioneer scientists artists and anyone who goes beyond just general societal constructs to do something new uh, so entrepreneurship is for me not getting defined by the role society expects you to because everyone sort of ends up getting solidified into the expectations they have even if you are a professor 
there is certain expectations you have and not all professors are for example entrepreneurs but someone who goes against what society expects them to be like say uh, they end up just going and creating like a new theory that to me is an entrepreneur so in that sense i think there's a fine line between a businessman and an entrepreneur a businessman can still act uh, in a way how business people are expected to act but i think i would define entrepreneur as someone who's fundamentally unpredictable because they'll end up doing something which you know nobody's expecting so surprise of action is a i think a big big factor for me when it comes to how i define entrepreneurship so very interestingly parasi you said that scientists can also be classified as entrepreneurs is it only when they commercialize their invention or you know i'm not associating it with like commercial utility at all i mean entrepreneurship i think it comes from a french word if i'm not mistaken mm-hmm. and it it literally means uh, venturing into unknown i think that's a literal definition of it and i think a scientist who plays it safe just does incremental things publishes paper because scientists are expected to publish papers i think that scientist is not an entrepreneur for me but someone who just takes the risk even a career risk hmm. spends 3 years even if it doesn't end up becoming any fruitful mm-hmm. but they at least try to do something which is new and expected i think that scientist would be an entrepreneur for me so then if you have to sort of framework guys at uh would you say where the risk reward equation people are playing for the upside reward with a major risk i think i would say it's more to do with uncertainty wherein if someone is doing something which nobody expects to work out <laughs> that person is an entrepreneur for me but it's very clear that a will lead to b and b will lead to c it's not an entrepreneur so trade people who do trading they are not mm-hmm. entrepreneurs by this definition sure but people who are building a toy just like say satoshi nakamoto was mm-hmm. building an algorithm everybody thought was very weird uncertain crazy he is an entrepreneur even if he is not creating or capturing i mean he is obviously creating a lot of economic value but not capturing that mm-hmm. so it's sort of dealing from any commercial consideration for me look at the genesis block yes well tell you for both, uh, both of these questions right for me both of these mean freedom happiness also means freedom to me right freedom in the relationships that i have right how free i feel uh not the way right <laughs> on the extreme side but but in a balanced way and entrepreneurship also means freedom yeah right if something that you own your time but actually i mean i think i had the same view but i'm sort of evolving from that because nobody is truly free we like to believe it but even the richest person yeah uh they would be obligated to someone they're obligated to certain contracts obligated to relationships obligated to their kids so the notion of complete freedom i think it's sort of like a misnomer and 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 i think on the opposite side people who are so called not free they can be very very happy as well because they've made internal peace with who they are and what their destiny is going to be but but uh to take both people who went deep into you know entrepreneurship as well as the definition of happiness were rebels initially so so i think that's the antithesis entrepreneurs never are happy by default so your default state is unhappy with the current environment you're saying because un- i'm unhappy with the current environment now i'm going to strive to make it better yeah and the moment you hit that goal you're like i need to find a new goal so if you look at uh, so if we sort of divide uh, go further uh, building something new can be in three layers so you are either a business person you're just trading you're a remixer you take ideas from here you do something here and you sort of create a new model which is either capital allocation and you remixing and then you are something like where you're true blue creating something new if we go on the right side of it every time you achieve a goal you're like acha ye to ho gaya next what do i do so you by default after a couple of months or a tea p- period in time you're unhappy with your current state and that's a honest yeah. trade i i think there is a clarification of terms needed mm-hmm. and i remember i was talked to my trainer and you know i asked him out of the blue are you happy and he said a really beautiful thing that stayed with me he said you know i'm happy but not satisfied i think that's a similar thing yep. with entrepreneurs that you can be terribly happy but you are perennially dissatisfied, dissatisfied with the state of the world <laughs> i think that's a good state yeah. to be in where uh, you dealing these two things you are completely happy on day to day world uh, day to day sense but you're not really given up on any change you want to change things around you want to change in the world you're not satisfied by how things are but that shouldn't really sort of determine whether you're ha- happy or unhappy but but somebody who is not unhappy will not ever pursue entrepreneurship right and it can be happiness and unsatisfaction like parasite and that's what i'm saying you can be happy but yeah. not satisfied so because somebody who's not unhappy will never pursue entrepreneurship like happy people don't create companies that's yeah. what you're saying right and i don't think that's true uh, that's what i'm thinking of huh. there's lots of happy people running around so, so happy and i think it would be terrible state of the world if yeah, yeah. all the innovation has happened 
thing by just no, what what i meant to unhappy say, people uh, happy but completely unsatisfied right and somehow this un unsat uh, this the uh, dissatisfaction is yeah. so 100% happy. agree i 100% agree that you have to be dissatisfied to be an entrepreneur if you're satisfied you're just okay with day to day evolution of how things are happening but you'll only venture out if you're just it can be curiosity it yeah. can be any feeling curiosity that curiosity is also like a fundamental form of happiness right you are pursuing your own curiosity and that gives you happiness yeah but you're dissatisfied because you don't know what's out there yeah. that's why i think this distinction is important you don't have to feel sorry about yourself in order to be an entrepreneur yeah. in fact you'll be a terrible entrepreneur if you're unhappy sure. you'll just give up too soon it's just so hard unless you are enjoying your job day to day you'll just give up in the first instance of a barrier and you'll say i don't like this yeah, so i concur with that so the only thing like if you look at why do people start companies either they have a pain point that they want to solve either they have a clarity of thought that hey i want to achieve this which is more on the greed side of it and some of those are tourist entrepreneurs but some of them also work out very well or you have a fundamental uh disagreement of what the current state of the world saying that the world should be much better compared to what it is today i don't think any of these three start with the point of unhappiness you're dissatisfied with what's there in the world and what you're agreeing to do is uh for the next maybe 10 to 20 years you're agreeing to put yourself in a path of major pain major disappointments and that's a choice that you make and if you're unhappy to start with you will not do that because then you're trying to find a way out to hey let me first be happy so happy but i think unsatisfied is a better construct yeah. from that uh, i think as a side note most i feel most people start companies because they want to prove to their parents <laughs> chip on the no, shoulder that they can sort of uh, so i think generally i mean if you go in the deep into hmm, uh, so no, okay. why so would people not just parents, want parents to, peers society i feel like general yeah. expectations Perfect, yeah. like as growing up maybe they they've had a developed a sense that sure. they need to prove themselves Hmm. I mean, I think to large extent, entrepreneurship is driven by the fact that they have to prove. And that's it. Because shorter actually is a great uh, sort of uh, qualifier metric for a lot of entrepreneurs who have succeeded. Because uh, this is something I learned from uh, Rav Botha. He was in uh, India, Sequoia, uh, see, uh, I think, senior partner or one of the co-founders. He said one of the best metric we have seen in our Sequoia portfolio companies across the world. The founders who have succeeded, they always had a chip on the shoulder, because in the and in your journey of entrepreneurship you'll hit deep dark moments the moment you hit that for you not to give up is you just remember what is your chip on the shoulder what are you trying to do that very innate personal need to prove like he gave a few examples just about 15 years ago like if you were a kid who was bullied in the school but like i'm going to show to every other kid you know what i was smarter than you if you're a nerd in the school and that deep in it because that has been sort of groomed in your mind in your formative years for about good 8 to 10 years in your primary school and that feeling is very very deep like up to show all those show to all those jocks how smarter than you and even in fear in the deepest darkest fears in that journey uh some of those work from a psychological perspective to we would say i'm going to persevere yeah so, i think i mean personally for me wing if i was my fifth attempt at doing a startup and i just kept trying again and again and again and i think every time i was just questioning that if i am not smart not. enough to like i was just proving to myself that why can't i succeed if i am keeping on failing again and again i think it was just to prove and with wingify my goal was to make 50000 rupees because i felt and that's the salary i was making and i felt that if i can't even make that amount of money for myself as an entrepreneur am i like so bad at this so and and i'm pretty sure wingify would not have worked out i would have tried six or seven times the same reason you know, the chip on the shoulder i just wanted to prove to myself that i'm not as bad uh, at building something so is that a dissatisfaction of, yeah can i just make my first dollar let alone like a million dollars or more but making the first dollar was just a very very strong driver for me and you made like 2 lakh rupees in the first month right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's Sorry. all luck like i would say that. ascribe it to luck but again you can amplify luck oh. if you're trying again and again and again so you both have never worked for somebody else no, i have not right i have worked for one year my first job but i was building wingify on the side yeah so the first day of my job i had told my boss i'll do this during weekends and evenings and most likely i'll not be here the next year but he was totally fine i totally respect him for that he gave a lot of freedom for me to build things but yeah very very briefly yeah so do you wish that you are missing something maybe a larger scale 
that you have ever imagined to say for example like somebody who has worked at facebook meta right? they would think that that meta is the ultimate thing that i want to build and let me absorb the best from meta okay let me rephrase this question should i have done something be more ambitious no. like, do, do, would i have done- do you think do you wish that you are missing something or do you think that you are missing something by not having no i don't think so so let me give you a simple example there are let's say a uh, couple of hundred thousand people at google apple meta all of those how many of those have created the next meta apple facebook or whatever it is when you are working somewhere you get to understand the scale in terms of systems and processes that says that learning i definitely want to have but can i get that learning without working for them absolutely yes here are three ways i do that one hire one of those guys who has been there two talk to a whole bunch of guys and just learn from them three most of these companies put out the systems and processes blocks and everything now for me the second thing is when you look at a very large company and you try to adopt the system and skills uh, processes it will not default work for you because that works for a certain skill so this from a implementation perspective from a ambition perspective i think that is very contextual to each founder so i'll give you for example like uh, so i sold fusion charts in 2020 then i sold the next one in 2022 for the last uh, year and a half or a quarter now uh, i've been unemployed pretty much unemployed jobless uh, just been needing around trying to figure out what next to do uh, even when i think about what next to do i have b- my first way to look at this is what do i like in the next company when i'm going to build what are the things i don't want so i don't want anything which is with regulatory impact anything which is highly operational sort of like consumer where every hour you cannot sleep like in a b2b you build a software you release it customers like it very rarely shit hits the fan so i have a via negativa which i call in that sense what i don't want to do but that's my choice because now i've sort of optimized my life to be able to say hey how to get a good night's of sleep how to spend enough time with my kids and that's very personal now do i aspire to be a billion dollar company i don't know yet now it's a very personal founder market fit as a uh, uh, sort of uh, assumption that you make that you want to scale yeah at fusion charts do we want to scale further we did as much as we could there were market forces which did not allow us to scale further do i want to scale further for sure yes but not at the cost of some of the uh, design choices for my life and i think the every founder when they want to grow see when you are young you are hugely like you are like you have no holds barred you try to do everything but as life moves on you have some constraints in life uh there are certain outliers obviously where they say i'm going to change the world uh 99% and this is a uh, controversial statement gonna say every founder says i'm going to change the world b2b me nobody changes the world you're not changing any world very simple in consumer in deep tech science yes you are changing the world so all this great statements that we say hey we are here to change the freaking world it's all bullshit you are here to make money you're here to help your customers you're here here to help your vc investors make money find your aspiration level it's okay to say i'm going to build build a billion dollar company and we do it it's okay also to say i'm going to build a 100 million dollar company there are so many 5 million dollar companies which could have been 5 million dollar companies who have died because they went the vc route and then they realize i'm in a no man's land and that is a freaky problem so one thing when you talk about ambition and the scale as a founder you need to realize what in my life i'm not willing to give up and what am i building it for and be real to yourself and the moment you say because i want to be like that another unicorn founder or i want to be in the social circuit it's good for a day but the journey is 10 to 15 20 years and if that uh, choices does not reflect your lifestyle choices your personality your design choices of life it is going to be absolute pay him so which is where when you think of scale do uh, do i want to build a facebook no no the amount of pressure like imagine sitting in front of a congressional hearing everybody asking you stupid questions no i want to do that no i want to think for in that sense i mean regrets are slightly uh, they're like cognitive biases because you can't just yeah. choose one aspect of someone else's life and say i wish i were like that you'll have to just take that replace yourself with that entire person so even if it's a celebrity you know you can't just expect to have the fame and the security of not being recognized and chased uh, you'll have to just have the both you know goods and bads and in that sense i think regrets uh i mean i personally don't believe in any regrets at all because i think you can't just pick one thread from history and imagine if my life was that because you'll automatically choose the best version of it right you'll not let's say imagine if you were in meta maybe you would have gotten embroiled in politics maybe you would have chosen a different path altogether this is almost infinite ways history can unfold so picking that just one and say i wish it were that this is infinity of other all history your life could have been like that so yeah i mean absolutely zero regrets yeah but let's say uh, you ran wingify for 13 years and before starting ninty 
right? You thought like, let me at least try to work for the best person uh, in the world, uh, possibly, so that maybe when I am building Ninti. But there is no best person, right? Or oh, best, wh- whoever you consider, right? So I'll no, but it. best, it's always best in something. Yeah. Like people are best in archery, people are best in selling, people are best in XYZ. So if there is things to learn, I agree. There is so many things you can learn from specific. But like Pallav said, I don't think you have to necessarily work for someone to learn. Like like this podcast, there's yeah. so many great resources out there. Uh, I think it's a high cost to pay. Yeah, I think that they're both ways, right? So so I'll I'll tell you, right? How how do I made that choice? So I started entrepreneurship like right out of college, just worked for nine months and while working at Amdocs, I was building my startup at night, right? So when I sold that startup in 2017 after running it for five years and worked with the acquired company for two years, I thought I had super amount of hustle, but I didn't have like a, the the best processes. So what do I do when I wanted to, you know, build next in SaaS? I thought, let me go out and I wanted to learn venture capital. So I worked with a VC firm that I admired. I went with, I went with Prime, right? And I thought, Prime, I'm not still, you know, there in terms of thinking and processes. And I want to, let's say, give next 20, 30 years, building large task companies in whatever form, right? Uh, later on, fund came. Uh, then I thought, let me try with Amazon Web Services, the largest SaaS company in the world. Let me try to observe their processes, be a part of it. I think it depends on personal yeah. motivations. For me, companies are a vehicle for something else. Yeah. Like for me, companies, I mean, I don't want to build a company for company's sake. In fact, it was if it was possible to do what I want to do without a company, it's better to do that. Why get all the operational craft? So, uh, huh, when I'm when I'm doing Ninti, it's from a very different source of motivation and inspiration than saying something like I want to have the best process in the company. I'd rather have no process at all yeah. and focus on what I'm motivated by. Yeah, it's, it's a completely personal choice. Even like I can tell from my own choice. Uh, uh, when I started building the fund, right, uh, I always longed to build a like a really large company. So, uh, let's say if I can't get you know like Pallav as a co-founder, at least can I be a part of Pallav's journey? The the co-founders that I admired, right? Mm-hmm. And can I be of someone of so value that they even look up to? So, so the thought process comes from there. Yeah, so it's I think very very personal motivation yeah. in that sense. So just to add on that, so when you go and work for a company, so let me pull out some very technical points. You don't get access to everything out there. Yeah. You are a cog in the wheel. You only get to learn what you're exposed to. Bunch of your learning is dependent on your peers and manager. Yeah. You don't control that. Third, bunch of those learnings don't sort of uh, directly, you can sort of uh, apply it back to your small startup because what works for a big company, 99% would not work for a small company. Number five, in that sense, whatever you are learning out there, you are learning it at a pace based on company's choice. Here, when you're building your own startup, like I believe fundamentally that the best way of learning is doing it yourself. So the reason, I mean, in my case, it was not just a choice. It just happened randomly, call it sheer luck, like force of nature, that I didn't have to work for somebody else. But if I have to learn something new, I will probably not look at saying, hey, I'm going to join this company. I'm probably going to say, who do I want to learn from? What do I want to learn from him? And what is the best way for me to learn from him in the minimum amount of time commitment? Even if it means I'll be interned to him for four hours a day for a particular topic. I don't want to learn. No person is good at everything. Yeah. No company is good at everything. And also when you're learning about a particular topic, the good thing is like with the deluge of the information in the world, podcasts, books, everything. But 80 to 90% of surface area you can cover just by sort of knowing what to freaking search on Google or YouTube or one of the uh, podcast channels out there. And all of that is fairly available. 80 to 90% chance you can connect to that guy and say, hey, I have three tactical questions. I freaking love your podcast. Can you please help me understand? And this is my context. You start a conversation because you're trying to basically say, what do I not know about a particular thing? You're covering the breadth. Then you're saying, okay, these three things which are very contextual to me, I want your opinion. Then you're going to the depth. Why do I need to spend a year at a company to do that? That's like maybe what, two days of work? Yes, I think the right question to ask when it comes to learning is what's the most efficient way of learning? Yeah. Uh, and getting a job at some place might not be the most efficient in certain contexts or in, even in most contexts. Maybe that's a bias, but I please that, right? If Girish wouldn't have worked at Soho for 
an x amount of time sure uh, fresh work for that have been there no but i mean there is lots of case that's survivorship where, bias yeah. that's very survivorship bias yeah i mean yeah. zuckerberg didn't yeah. work anywhere yeah. so i mean i think for any example yeah. you can find a counter yeah. example who is so okay where yes they are half i mean it's very survivorship bias because you are thinking that he's applied the same playbook no he's applied a lot of new things as well in fact interestingly i think if you take like a top 10 tech companies top oh. 100 More likely than not, people would not have worked anywhere else. Bezos, I think he has never worked anywhere. Yeah, Zuckerberg yeah. so, has never. Yeah. Google guys haven't worked anywhere. Yeah, so uh, then Zuckerberg has never worked anywhere. Staff founder has never worked anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. most of this. So uh, I think one, we're over one, indexing one. on that. Yeah. So it's good to have mentors. It's good to have somebody to ask uh, question. But I think in the current world where the world is hyper network, uh, you're like we say we are six connections away from anybody. I think at our stage, we are probably two or three connections away from anybody in the industry that we are in. you ask a question and you frame it nicely you get an answer and i think when you're building stuff uh, people are more likely to give you feedback because they have a reference point Good. versus you're asking a very theoretical question yeah. so you're going out and saying i'm building a social network how do i solve this particular problem i think people are very much likely to give you an answer versus if you approach someone and says can what you just mentor me no no what should i build today no can you just no can you just mentor me also if it's contextual what should i build today I mean, no, but very lot of people question. come and ask me that, mm. "Can you be my mentor?" And that's such a like a vague Wait, question, uh, which like I obviously can't mentor you, yeah. right? You giving me no reason to tell me that uh, this is going to be helpful, or you not even providing me what do you want to be mentored on. So uh, I guess the more specific you are about the learning, the more efficient it can be. And uh, most entrepreneurs, you know, when they start, they say that we want to make an impact on the world, right? Uh, Did you, when you both started, or even during the journey, that you had such notion that we are creating X impact? To so I'm going to be very brutally honest about it. Number one impact you're going to make in your world is your own in your own life in a B two B. See, if you are solving very hard science problems, you solve cancer, you're making impact on the world. You pe move people to Mars, you're solving here. Yeah. Uh, so if you're talking about a B two B freaking product, whatever you do, everything is freaking marketing speaks. We are not making any impact on anybody's world in that fundamental sense. But that being said. the impact we make in their world let's say we help them get promoted we help them look good in their careers which is meaningful impact in their own personal life so making impact in our lives we are making a meaningful impact in their lives but there's no hey we're going to change the world so that's all marketing bullshit in my post so i think there's two ways to look at it one changing the world even in b2b sense you are changing the world uh every, even by just existing you're changing the world right oh. so it's a continuum like oh. you are you interacting oh, with people you the world That's what I'm saying. Right? It's a vacuous. If you really drill it down, when do you say you've changed the world? What's the threshold? There's no objective sense of threshold. It's very, very personal. But in, when it comes to companies, I think um, missions of companies are good stories, um, but they always take a backseat when it comes to companies being in the marketplace because almost always the economic considerations takes the forefront. So Google's don't be evil. Apple's think different. Whatever mission statements. they are great for you to believe that you are doing something meaningful but the whole logic of capitalism i think that forces you to prioritize so a profit you know, over everything like else. the first iphone change the freaking world uske baad sir abhi ke beech mein kya fark hai acha camera thoda bada screen it has not yeah. changed the world in the last that much years yeah you get better apps faster processor the first one was absolutely world changing it got so many people more connected you have one device to do whole bunch of things between the first and now that's incremental change and they're just backing on top of that but why do you have so, to change the world i mean that's a fundamental question exactly. you should ask yourself <laughs> no, because every entrepreneur wants to say hey we are here to make an impact in the world make a dent in the world change the world that's a classic statement every because nobody wants to admit the dirty truth that you need to make money exactly for a yeah sabko yaar you raise money from investors investors need to make money you need to make yeah, that's your always need to make money you have to return return yeah correct no so on the science side so which is what i'm slightly differentiating so like you do something on let's say but, I mean, in that sense, I think the reason businesses exist is to commercialize. There's only one reason for business to yeah. exist: to create value for shareholders. To commercialize. So, in yeah. that sense, I mean, scientists obviously uh, they exist purely for like discovering new and novel things, right? So, so, so something which changes the world, like helping you save life, like a vaccine that saves your life, that changes your life. You know, it's so hard to raise money for exactly. like like a deep tech company, and the no. reason for that is. the expected returns are so much lower versus building let's say a b2b company correct yeah. like as an investor if you're purely going by your like returns logic sure you would never fund a very very risky scientific bet minus some investors yeah okay. yeah yeah and but that's how things are right and that's why governments have to play a role 
in sort of really sponsoring scientific research. There's a fun thing uh, I was reading somewhere. Actually, one of the YouTube videos I was watching. So you know this vacation uh, timeshare properties. Timeshare properties convince that people and they try to convince other people we help save people's life. What are you selling? Timeshare, we are selling vacation rentals. And it's one of the most uh, sort of gnarly business to be in because you're convincing somebody to part with the money of the life and you give shitty services. But the way they convince their people and them, you know how we save life? Because people, when they go to vacation, they're less stressed. If they're less stressed, they'll be healthier. If they're healthier, they will die lesser. Like it's like a long elaborate process of convincing yourself that we are selling a shitty fucking product, but we have to build a marketing message out of it. So I think a lot of this is marketing speak, a lot of this. So, but I, did, I think everyone no. in their heart, they know. No, that's a problem. Like they're no, not changing no, the no, word. No, that's, that's, illusion, that's, right? that's the illusion. So we have sort of agreed to it. And that is it. No, people, people, people suspect they're not changing the world. No, a lot of people actually believe. So that conflation of that fact, he, hey, so I am very okay when somebody says, Mere ko paise banana. that is why I started my company. I'm very okay with somebody who's saying, I'm really changing the world. And if you're doing that, hey, kudos to you. But somebody who's building another, let's say, hypothetically, sorry, Paris, no dig at you, sending a marketing message when I already get 30 on my phones every on my uh, average day. And you're saying, I'm going to change the world because I help my customers sell more products to the other guys when both of them have no need and we're creating more mess in the world. That's not changing the world. Then be very clear. Yeah? You want to make money for yourself, for your investors, be clear. But the thing which happens is, for you to hire your people, you have to build a story around it. So everything sort of uh, mothballs into a bigger and bigger and a bigger mothball. And then yeah, you nobody would work at a company that says we exist to make profit. <laughs> but that's the, or always, that's the most they honest. They were, they were thinking, give us more of your profit. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> but what I was coming to is right up. Uh, entrepreneurs, they, for example, Zook might try to make sure that Facebook or Meta is the most relevant thing that existed in his lifetime. Right. That's why. There are so many attempts, now threads, uh, like even entrepreneurs when we are talking about, they want to make an impact. But I was saying, it, uh, uh, impacts are just very dust in point of time, even everything, right? And yeah, so, I mean, that's 100% true. I mean, even Earth wouldn't exist in a billion years, so. Yeah. Also, uh, also why, the question, exist, yeah, or why the need having to Having fun along yeah, the way. So that's why, why the need to create along Why the story having to make an impact? Along the way, having right? fun, so, why you're alive, you do something interesting. Uh, and that's Absolutely. about it. Right? Yeah. So legacy from a point of view of an ego issue. I don't believe in that. Legacy from a point of view of building an institution which is like sustained for years and delivered value. I completely agree. But that's the function of... See, tech name obsolution is so high. So here's a fun fact. IBM has about $100 billion in revenue today. Even today. Nobody considers IBM in the tech industry or a startup industry to be a... Oh, this is a great freaking company. Like none of their products, any of the startups use. $100 billion in revenue. Here at 1 billion in revenue, we celebrate, oh, not unicorn, they are a 1 billion revenue company. They are doing 100 billion. But that legacy of that has not sustained now for us in the start. But if you go to the big enterprises, they're like, IBM freaking works for us. So legacy also is, who's left legacy? Chodha. Hypothetically, let's say, if, uh, like, there are fashion brands who have a legacy for 200, 300 years. You might not even have heard of it. They might leave in that sphere of their influence. And for them, that is important. Is it an ego thing? Is it a value add? And the way we look at this is, every ecosystem is not about just this unidimensional factor. There are so many things which make an ecosystem. If you combine ecosystems of ecosystem, there are more things to be combined. One legacy, when you say, uh, in tech industry, nobody else will know. So what are you leaving the legacy for? I think legacy is proxy for trying to be mortal, not die. I think it's the same reason why people have kids, so that some part of it can continue. For entrepreneurs, if companies are almost like kids, it's just natural to expect that they would last beyond their own lives. But thinking that it's something stable, source of presence across the end of time, that's obviously a big, big cognitive bias. That doesn't happen. If something like solar system would exist in the long run of things, then uh, your company is just like a drop in the ocean. Maybe that comes from the selfish gene, the book explained by Richard Dawkins. Yeah, I mean, everything, I mean, if you've read the book Denial of Death, the reason people wage wars is simply because they can't believe they'll be dead once. So they just want to pursue bigger and bigger things uh, in hopes of just creating the so-called bigger and bigger impact so that they, they're they at least in people's minds, they last beyond their own body, right? It's just this pursuit of, this wrong idea of being immortal. The next is, what does drive you? Then give me a kick, kiss, So for me, uh, what I've, uh, what I like to really do is, uh, and again, based on 
what I've done in the past is I really like polished products from India. So when I built Fusion Charts also, we were one of the very early products. Hold on, hold on the thought, right? So drive is very personal, right? Uh, for me, uh, there's two kind of drive, right? One is professional drive and I have to go back into it. For me, the drive is learning, right? Putting myself in an environment where I'm constantly learning. So let's go back. Uh, for me, in that case, the drive is to really put out... Uh, so let's take a step back. The reason why I like that drive of building the best products from India is I don't want to be living under a colonial hangover saying that we can only build services from India. And as, which is where I was building to the story as well. When we built Fusion Charts, we are the best starting library in the world. We built a whole bunch of other products as well, second company as well. I fundamentally believe that India has the capability and the skills to be able to deliver world-class products. And I think Paras has also done great with his product as well. So for me, the drive is to be the best in the world in that particular area that I own. So in the last two stints, it was about data visualization. I was really, really, really good at that. And uh, we built two companies and we sold two out of that. Uh, now the drive is again to be able to say, hey, what is that one insight or what is that area where I want to be so good that I'm not just said, hey, this is a guy from India. It has to be, oh, like I'll tell you a story, Fusion Charts, when we were selling, bunch of our customers, when we went to US and did a trade show, they said, if we realize you were from India, we would have asked a discount. In India, we made a bunch of Indian customers. They said, if we knew you were from India, we would not even have bought you because if you put that polish out there. So for me, that drive is to really, really build that great things in terms of product, great things in terms of customer experience, and whatever it takes for me to learn to be able to do that. Personal drive right now is more about uh, me designing my life in a way where I have literally zero guns to my head. So while Para said that nobody is free in the world, I'll partly agree to it. But in most of the context, I have no guns to the head. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking to a friend, uh, fun story. Uh, when he signed his VC term sheet, the VC informally told him, you cannot tweet anything about politics. I'm like, I'm living in a country which is a democracy. If I don't voice my opinion as a civic member of the society, as a member who's contributing his taxes and his duties, why the f what the f am I doing here? Now, for VCs, because that can become a turmoil at some point in time, that freedom, because I have, I have not raised money and I have zero guns to my head, I value that freedom of my ability to express my thoughts, ability to do my actions, ability to be stupid, but still be able to say, hey, while I contribute value, I have a personal life and I want to uh, not project an image of what I am not. And that drive is very, very clear to me that this is who I am. This is how I'm going to live my life. This is what I'm going to teach my kids. This is where I can add value, not just to me, to people I help, to founders I, uh, I've invested in or help them with, to friends who are a part of my life. And, uh, and I'm going to be real with them. And to be able to do that, there's a lot of things you need to sort of put in motion to be able to say, this is who I am, this is why I am able to do certain things. That's my personal drive in that sense. Yeah, so my drive is uh, creating, solving problems in a very creative way. So it's almost like, again, um, creativity plays a big role, wherein, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say entrepreneurship problems or product problems are hard problems uh, in the sense of intellectually hard, but I think they're hard in the sense of being so multidimensional that the answer is not obvious in the first go. So I really, really enjoy the process of navigating the different constraints and trade-offs and being able to find a creative solution. And I think the feedback to that solution when someone out there uses your product and says, you know, this is really good. I think that's the biggest driver. And can you build something that other people love? And building something that other people love is a very, very non-trivial problem. Because people are generally running around being more or less satisfied with their life. So how can you build something that people say, I was missing this in my life? I think that's that's a big driver. I think one of your other big drives is also exploration of very diverse set of topics, diverse set of people that you meet. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, I was talking about... You try not to be my... unidimensional. Yeah. Like you become a more sort of... A... In, at least in really from a professional context, I think the driver is to solve these problems. But obviously... At a personal level, I think my biggest driver is just curiosity. So I would be equally interested in, let's say, uh, theoretical physics, psychology, evolution, and all those things. I just want to learn more and more. And I think creating products is also like one way of learning a lot of what makes people tick. And um, yeah, that's what sort of sort of gets me up every morning. So one observation that I have, right? Uh, I love you have invested in more than 100 companies, right? And uh, 
you would have absorbed something from uh, Paris through these 11 years or 13 years of friendship and uh, you have invested in very few companies yeah, <laughs> <That> is, <laughs> yeah I don't like into investments yeah, yeah. so so uh, just want to touch upon this topic right uh, uh, because Pallav would have been a huge impact right and uh, because he was such a dear friend professionally personally so so why did this then seep into your life for the last 11 20 years I think I mean for me um, like learning is a much broader like like I said you know uh, I'm interested in just a number of things and very few of those things have to do with commercial concentration for example uh, and and angel investment I'm sure it gives a lot of learning but I think it gives learning in a very specific context uh, I mean I would happily pay for someone to teach me quantum physics even if it's an investment not investment so in that sense my drives are much much sort of broader in domains versus being very interested in just what makes money um, so and it's also a lot of effort it's a lot of time investment I mean I I mean I believe I I mean if someone is doing angel investments for making money I think it's a much more expensive way to do versus putting something in just the index funds and letting market do the job but if someone is doing angel investments for learning I totally understand that but that learning only happens in a very certain context So what's your drive of angel investing like? So uh, it has changed over the stages so when I started in 2000 I think I wrote my first check in 2010 or 11 it was in Calcutta so me and Abhishek wrote our runs in the te- uh, technologies bit size services firm we realized that whole bunch of VCs are there in uh, North, West and South. Nobody's investing in the Calcutta ecosystem. At that point in time, I was in Calcutta for about 10 years. So we're like, hey, can and both of us were bootstrapped on the pinners. We still are bootstrapped on the pinners. And we're like, hey, we need to do a bunch of things for Calcutta. We started the fund. Unfortunate fact, for the first three years, we could not find any good company in Calcutta to invest. Uh, 2010, we started the fund. Uh, when I say the fund, we didn't raise money from other people. It was just a brand seeders. It was mine and Abhishek's money. 11, I moved to Bangalore and then every city you move, like uh, upper tier, you realize the quality of the entrepreneurs go higher. So uh, now sort of there's a playing field between US and India entrepreneurs. In most of the cases, there are certain deep tech cases where US entrepreneurs have a much larger vision, ambition or a local market uh, scenario in that sense. So when first time I started investing, my thesis was let's build something for the Calcutta ecosystem. When I moved to Bangalore, I was like, let me figure out what are the better companies out there in Bangalore because suddenly you're like you've been you literally you're like a fish in the pod you've been thrown from a sorry fish in the whale you've been thrown from a fish in the whale to fish in the pond and then when you look at US like you're a fish in the ocean in that sense so when I came here they realized hey there's so much learning for me so my first incentive was to learn then the third was when this is about probably 2014 till about 18, 19 where I did far and few it was about hey there's money to be made so uh, there is a financial incentive, no doubt. But what I did, uh, initially I would invest in a lot of different sort of uh, industries, whether it's back in the days, it was not called D2C, sort of B2C Lelo, B2B Lelo. We did offline businesses, whole bunch of those. We even did investments where we said, our uh, gains are not going to be on the capital gains, which is on the equity. We're going to take dividend. We made a whole bunch of mistakes out there. So there was really record that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we said, hey, everybody invests for capital gains. And we did a couple of companies. Didn't work out, obviously. We thought, hey, I'm dividend of selling it. And profit sharing hoga and all of that. Didn't work out. So for us, it was. And every time I did that, there were new learnings which are coming in. So then I started investing in a couple of media companies, which helped me understand how media works. So now my thesis is basically twofold. One, can I get to learn a new thing by being in a navigator seat, not in a driver's seat? Because when you're running your own company, you can't run another company, practically. So the kind of learnings I've had on how a media business operates or how a B2C operates or how a, a B2C health company operates just by reading what's happening to them or sitting on a once a quarter or once, a, a once in every six months with the founder over beers and talking about bhai chal kya rahe, batao where, go, where can I help? And then every founder brings in, so two questions that I ask every founder. What are the interesting growth hacks that you have done? What are the interesting hacks you have done overall in the company? And each one has a story. Most of those will not be published because they are too... Uh, eccentric to be published in a media and when you talk about that like you either have a good laugh or you're like this is beautiful and more and more when you do that you realize there's a lot of different uh, founders doing different things in a different way which is learning for you and I could take some of those learnings and apply in my company now because I'm jobless and unemployed 
uh, when I invest in a new company, I'm like, hey, is there ability to sort of scale this up while learning and while helping the founder as well? So for me, uh, uh, if you ask me today, if I can't hang out with the founder who I've invested in, I will not invest. Because if the founder is not willing to share, he is not open, he is not coachable, he is not adaptable, he is not uh, somebody who is uh, sort of like thinks of me as, hey, I respect your opinion and it's completely okay, you don't uh, implement that. So it's sort of a partnership in that way. So there's a learning out of that. There's a sense of, I, uh, I have a responsibility to help you. And the third part is obviously the financial return right now. Even though we are still deploying our own money, we don't use other people's money. Now, a more serious question in this part, the second part. <laughs> you. Why is <laughs> <serious> to me? <laughs> because you are the serious guy. No, I am not. <laughs> what compared does, to me, Paris. Uh, compared to you. <laughs> uh, what does death mean to you? I think it means inevitability. Where, uh, I mean, I know it's the obvious answer, but again, I think I would just contrast it with not dying the whole. Uh, I think at one point of time, in fact, my first blog was called Immortal Blog because I never wanted to die. And there was this very strong feeling of, uh, very strange feeling of realizing that you're going to die. And I mean, I do feel at the very core, people don't believe they're going to die. They might intellectually know. But I think the way we go around in our lives, day to day behave, uh, I think is just very, very Im almost impossible to internalize. I, I actually feel nobody has really internalized they are going to die until the last moment. I think that's just because the whole biology and evolution uh, pushes us to sort of fight against the inevitability. Uh, but I also feel death is what makes life absolutely wonderful. Uh, if people are immortal, they'll get terribly, terribly bored of doing... I mean, if you're immortal, everything will happen. The same things will happen infinite number of times, right? There's just finite amount of atoms going around in the universe, so... If you were never to die, you would repeat the same things all over and over again. It'll be super, super boring. So strangely, death is just what makes life worth it. And I just tend to remind myself of that again and again. Uh, but I do know at the very core, I also believe that I'm not going to die, even though knowing that I'm, that's probably the outcome. But that belief that uh, you are going to die or your loved ones are not going to be there at some point in time. Has it changed the way you live? Ah, certainly. I think it's it's uh, impacted um, very strongly by reprioritizing a lot of things. One, it's helped me reprioritize health because I know if there is a way you could have a longer and healthier life, why not choose that? It has helped me focus increasingly more on friendships, uh, and relationships with my parents, with my family. Uh, it's also made me realize work is one aspect of life and it's not be all and end all to it. And strangely, like what we were talking about, it's also, I think, um, um, puts a big dent into the whole legacy drive which you have, I mean, which I had in my 20s, where I felt I had something to prove to others, I want to leave a legacy. All those things have completely disappeared. What I want to do is just have happy days one after another almost until the last moment and if that happens it's a fulfilling life for me happy days might mean something different for different people yeah for me it's like <laughs> 7 out of 10 <laughs> a well balanced day day after day until the last moment is you don't want to call it happy ending <laughs> that that also right <laughs> why not <laughs> why why that's a joy in itself why would you take it away <laughs> Pala, what about you yeah so for me most uh, like look, look at life very practically uh, death is just another event in life it's the exit event in an entrepreneurial sense of a life well lived now it is not about the death it is about how well you live your life and what sort of support systems you build for people around you whether it's mentally spiritually financially uh, especially when I have kids that when I die they are not in a turmoil. Now, you don't want to go to either extremes, you want to be in the center. You're all going to die. Now, what Paras said about health, so I'm, well, I'm generally, uh, like he has become extremely health conscious in the last year, year and a half, and like his fitness is obviously a proof of that testament. I go through these cycles, I'm like, I'll be fit, then I'll be sort of letting loose, and for me, this has become part of my life. I would not over-optimize my life's choices, saying that I want to delay the death because 
I am going to be so if you have to uh, delay death, you will say I'm going to make all the healthy choices in life. I'm going to leave uh, alcohol uh, for years. I'm going to quit whole bunch of things. I'm going to wake up six in the morning. Uh, I'm a slightly more hedonistic guy. I believe that life has to be lived, and at some point you are to die. You can't cheat death. You can sort of push death by a couple of years or whatever it is, but you're gonna be there. So I'll not do something where I die tomorrow, and I'll also not do something where I'm like for thirty years I'm gonna live like a fucking monk so that I live for ten more years to die because then that's not my life. It is inevitable. It is an exit moment of your life. The question is, have you lived your life successfully and success happily, successfully, meaningfully, whatever term you want to use? That's a very personal choice of what you want to do, and maybe different decades. You decide how you want to live your life differently, and it's a very personal choice. Society tries to dictate what's the ideal freaking life, but I think as on the panels, which Parah said, we are anyways defining society. So it's your personal choice of what life means to you in that sense. I think it's important to distinguish between lifespan and health span. I think the point is not to live a long life for its own sake, right? Uh, but the point is, if you can live a longer life with being equally healthy, having Good rich relationships, having good work, why not? So, um, I mean, you don't want to spend the last twenty years of your life bedridden. I, I don't think that's the point of life. Is just to be there, lying there, and in that sense, I think uh, really discounting what you're doing today is probably uh, not a wise decision. You do have to take into account your future self. Where at some point of time, you are going to be that person, and you don't want to be blaming your past self for. Giving you an extremely shitty series of years or even decades. But then, do you believe in euthanasia? Then I do, I do, I do believe in it. Uh, I think. What is the threshold for you to decide? Hey, is it one year on the bed, five years on the bed, ten years on the bed, where you decide euthanasia? No, at any point of time where I feel there is no hope in a better life, I think it's a natural decision to not sustain in a hopeless fashion, right? Artificially, yeah. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> but India doesn't allow that, and I hope it does. It's. Um, I mean, I, I can't believe government has something to say about people taking their own life, uh, which is the, one of the strangest things out there. I mean, I I, I think they they have a valid point when it comes to suicide due to mental issues. The point is to maybe help treat them. But if a mentally sane person wants to just end it all, I think they should be very happy That's ways of doing that. We should celebrate. We got a life well lived instead yeah. of mourning that. Right? If you try to kill yourself in euthanasia, we're gonna put you in jail. We're like. Why do you see the irony in that? <laughs> sure. No, I mean, I'm if if there is a preventable cost, I think. No, this is, I'm talking about old age where you're sort of literally living on an artificially sustained yeah, I mean, environment. Then, then people have a choice. I mean, if people are deciding and mm. they are completely mentally healthy, let yeah. them do that. Tha, that is where the tricky situation comes on. How do you prove somebody is mentally healthy when they're on the? Yeah, I mean, we are into the, the murky territory. I agree. Correct. But I think if someone is suffering from mental disorder, which can be cured. Sure. Then at least there needs to be an intervention that because you would want other people to do to you. Sure. Also, for the age, no. So let's say what you're talking about is let's say some reason twenties, thirties, forties. But imagine, let's hypothetically put a cut off date after which euthanasia should be legally allowed. Let's put sixty eight. No, euthanasia but, should be allowed at any point of time. Uh, murky again. So sixty eight can be terminally ill at any age, right? You could have ha, terminally ill is one of the qualifiers. Yeah. Mm. But let's not drop the, the law here. <laughs> Nobody is going to take us seriously. <laughs> at what age uh, you attained financial independence in your eyes, at least, right? How did you change your choices in life? I think very, very early in Wingify, let's say, and that's because not because I made a lot of money, but because my desires have been capped. Uh, I think I'm very happy just buying a 500 rupees book. <laughs> that's um, uh, that's financial independence for me. So. Maybe as soon as I never thought about whether I should buy a book or not, is when I achieved financial independence, where I could just click and on Amazon and buy it without looking at the price. Uh, maybe it was when I was, let's say, twenty-four. Let me define financial twenty-four. That yeah, that realization that you never have to work for money ever again in your life. Yeah, twenty-four, twenty-four, twenty-five, and that has since changed the choices. I think I never worked for money in that sense. I, just, I worked to prove I could build something useful. So in that sense, I'm pretty sure if Wingy Five would not have worked out, I would have maybe worked somewhere else. But that would have been very temporary, sort of a thing, just a step to do my sixth startup. If that would not have worked out, I would have done seventh. Uh, I think it was just built for this. 
and uh, ultimately i think in startups if you keep trying one of them would crack so uh, and i'm reasonably reasonably confident saying that i would have achieved financial independence maybe the age would have differed yeah but that's because startups are a great wealth creator and if you keep trying to do startups again and again one time something will crack so it's almost an inevitability if you have the entrepreneurship gene in you that you'll end up being relatively financial well off some point in your life what about you pallav define financial independence again again pallav i still don't like, have it yeah that's <laughs> as long as i don't have a private like jet private jet it's not financially you forgot the island in the yacht ha huh? you forgot the island in the yacht yeah. well, let's say whatever your current lifestyle was at that point of age hmm. right you said now i don't have to earn a single penny more to sustain that lifestyle for the rest of my life so that i've never achieved because what happens with uh money is every time you make more you sort of upgrade your life's choices and lifestyle to sort of uh so i would not want to say that you match your uh, income to your expenses i'm very conservative in that sense and i have certain ratios that i follow in totally but every year you make more money you sort of buy new things and you get new uh let's call it boys toys let's call it what family needs and everything there's probably not going to be a point in time where you can ever say if i never work again I'll be able to sustain. So even if I sort of uh, hypothetically after selling two companies, but I made enough out of that and also of all the profit, what changes is I don't know what the kids would need. I know if there's going to be emergency. I don't know if there's going to be a completely unforeseen incidents of any freaking kind where I can say, hey, I'll be able to take care of all of that. So and also the fact of financial independence. So if you would have said uh, financial independence is where you did not have to go and. Uh, take a loan or ask your dad for money i think that would be at the age of 19 for me you know, i mean i completely disagree with that but um i think i mean there's an interesting book that has also come up i don't know whether you read it but it's called die with zero and i um and it's a very interesting concept which i also believe in that you should aim to die with zero money in your bank and um uh, and also when it comes to the worst case scenarios i think it's impossible to predict worst worst case scenarios yes sure. so you and have to buy the earth right and you have to buy by definition oh. even the richest person cannot prevent a worst case scenario if like a meteor is coming on the earth what would that person so do then the you, money then money is that the last thing i think even, even, so in that sense what you can really prepare for is bad scenarios sure and not worst case scenarios and yes. if you know what bad scenarios are likely to going to cost to you I think at some stage you can say that this money is enough. I mean, I feel for me, if I don't have to work rest of my life, I can sustain for myself. And at the very simple way, if you have X amount of money, you see, uh, you calculate like, what does it come if you say your life expectancy eighty and ninety per month? How much that money manifests into? Even if not, you take into account the appreciation of it. Sure. And if your monthly expenses are less than that, no, so I'll give you a, unless you feel your lifestyle. continues to so, become the, expensive over year over year the reason i don't believe in this philosophy is because let's say you have x amount of money you put it in a, some investment banks are failed in the world countries are failed in the world there's no 100% guarantee to be able to say hey if i stop working today there's a 100% guarantee based on my current expense i'll be able to live because your money also is being handled But by this some, is a, i mean this is a source of endless anxiety right you will never anxiety. get that certainty at what point of time you will get certain no, so which is where you are always so my if banks are failing i think uh, so my belief is at any point in time be skilled enough to be able to say i am able to match my current expenses based on there, there is a difference between being skilled enough to be able to work and to actually work that your optionality yeah so you will obviously we want to be relevant so that when it like when it you actually have to work you're able to work sure but until then uh financial freedom really means right you don't have to work just for money but your thesis is that you always would need to earn more and more and that's what i'm saying i think at some point of time at my belief is totally the opposite you should aim to have zero money when you're sort of yeah. dead uh, i agree with more of your point of view that you know at some point of time you realize that the rest of your life if you sustain with this lifestyle some emergency money right or if you if you buy some land for your family that you don't need to work for a single day you're working out of your own personal choice of yeah. happiness freedom whatever it is i think if you don't work you lose uh, you lose your sense of life you lose purpose you lose your gray matter you lose so like, there's a difference between you don't have to work and you need to working for money i think versus the the just realization that you don't have to work sure. i think that 
gives a lot of clarity in the kinds of works you end up choosing exactly and i think that's an important bit that's optionality yeah that's, that's important bit like i'm still sure. working but i don't need to work correct in that sense nobody can put a gun on my head and sure. do thing like no i would never sign like a term sheet with that comes with hmm. the fact that you can't tweet so if that is a difference I'm financial part. independence i think that i got at i don't know maybe uh 28 29 where with that philosophy that okay sometimes some things may hit the uh, shit may hit the fan but if i never have to work again but i choose to work because i like to work and i want to create value probably 27 28 one of those years but uh, that whole so sort of uh, deviating i fundamentally don't believe in the fire movement i don't believe that hey you retire early and just enjoy life yeah, i don't even know what retirement even means uh, even i don't know so many while i'm jobless and unemployed for me right now i'm pursuing new curiosity skills ability to sort of help other founders because at a point in time imagine you're not doing anything what the f- are you going to do in the house no so for who's a for example let's say what if lots of people do nothing in the house well. whatever you know, <laughs> see your person other wives if they're happy <laughs> <laughs> whatever is very very busy <laughs> working hard whatever, whatever curiosity you're pursuing that doesn't pay you a single penny for the next 10 years maybe sure. it'll pay you a big amount at 10 years 20 years but that doesn't pay you would you be happy with it absolutely that's a long term plan then i mean that's probably one of the better plans because if you have the ability to take a 10 20 year bet saying I am so good at it that only the five people in the world will do it. But you have the ability to just do that and take a 10 20 year bet and the payoff is massive. That risk reward ratio because let's say if I say no financially in your statement independent to not ever worry about the money. That's the better willing to take. But finding those opportunities are is the most difficult part. Like which bet do you take because the world is moving so 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 fast right now. You don't know what is going to be relevant in 20 years. I think lately I had a realization if you're financially independent I think two choices make a lot of sense either you should do like a totally uh non-profit kind of a work where you're just literally with yeah. no expectation of return you're almost like bill gates the second option is I think you should create art which is also like non-profit but art I'm really meaning in a very broad sense of doing things that just elevate a way of living and thinking almost an absurd thing which nobody is expecting so a very limited view of life paris you can also help other people move forward like what i'm doing with other founders as well like while i don't make money out there i'm saying the people i'm i'm saying what you need to exclude if you're financially uh free is uh an expectation of getting paid back no no for your work because a lot of other people are willing to do that job no, which is i'm saying there is only certain roles in society that financially independent people can play paid forward and probably it makes paid sense forward. to do Be, that no which is well like you talked about two like let's say angel investment now the straight forward pay it forward correct so helping other people succeed because now you have time yeah so doing that without expectation without getting a return expectation. that's very noble so that's Sorry. what i'm saying i think mm-hmm. one option is probably to do things where you have zero expectation of return sure. hmm. the second is to maybe just do something which is art comedy absurd which makes no sense at all which nobody would fund for commercial reasons but they should exist because they really nourish the soul agree Yeah. or you can even go into like sort of changing uh policies for society being part of think yeah. tanks because you have a lot of knowledge because then you're looking at what can you do for the greater good without yeah. uh expecting something back yeah, because everyone is working with the expectation of return i think it's a very yeah good way to pursue opportunities where you absolutely don't expect anything in return is that's how you'll uplift the society but, but people are even designed for it yeah why not i mean so many people in history i've done things with no expectation of return i know i mean if you're an entrepreneur and you've made a lot of money by purely creating value for yourself i think it's a very very hard mindset change uh but i think there's examples all around almost like let's say bill gates i mean in india bill gates is a controversial right no, no, because in india nandan nilkari i mean he is one of the most beautiful examples of pushing india as a country ahead like miles and miles ahead through his own uh different programs and everything whether we talk about upi aadhar a uh, whole bunch of programs is running like selflessly doing and pushing india forward in that sense uh why do we need a bill gates as an example when we have our own nandan nilkani yeah. here in india most of the it services founders have done enormous amounts of charity whether it's mr prem ji mr nadar whether it's nandan nilkani whether it's uh, mr murthy as well all of them basically and they have sort of reached that place with like we need to move society forward like with your point of die with zero i don't think they're looking at that but like we have created enormous value for the country for the people like it industry started by those was started by those guys we're talking about 3 million people getting uplifted directly indirectly 
and now they're deploying money in education they're deploying money in whole bunch of things so many more examples in terms of what does paid forward mean i'm doing it in a very small minuscule way by helping other saas founders these are like magnanimously large uh, examples in our own country in that sense yeah i do think i mean you owe it to other people because you are a construct of a society just because yeah you were born in a not a poor family you got educated you got opportunities like even literally the fact that my father got me a computer and someone else is didn't that made the whole difference so there is a sense of obligation of giving back to the society that actually made your life possible i have a question for you parth do you think the charity gene comes after a certain age or is this uh, inherent in humans with like yes i do charity or yes i do not do charity hypothetically like a lot of these people who sort of committed to the giving pledge were post 50 or 60 let's say 20 and 30 we are so materialistic and hedonistic is it a function of age or is it a function of something else i think it's a function of realization that uh, more money is not going to make you more satisfied in life yeah but in 30 you can buy a whole bunch of sports cars yachts uh, yeah but i i'm sure bill gates would have bought prem ji would have bought but after maybe a couple of cars they would have realized it's not worth it so i think money does have marginal returns in your life satisfaction and after that if you could why not just pay it back it just this like purchasing power is lying with you why not redistribute it i think it's just natural and i think it's obviously a lot to do with evolutionary uh drives of increasing our status so there is benefit of charity out there it's not all selfless if it were selfless we will not see names on buildings charities would be anonymous so there is a large extent of status also being involved in the mix but i think it's a good trade off if others get balanced and you have a name on your building yeah you know? but what are the things that give you anxiety that that you fear about mr pallav feared about like not having left enough for his kids i think what gives me anxiety is uh, the possibility of my mind not being functional so not being able to think not being able to creative because uh i mean i derive a lot of satisfaction of from reading and digesting complex ideas being creative in my problem solving so um getting any kind of mental illness which to a large extent i don't have any control over i think that is like my biggest fear um of just waking up one day and realizing maybe my memory is gone my thinking ability is gone i think partly it had happened where i felt growing a company was not intellectually stimulating me and that's one of the reasons i shifted my role from ceo to chairman and i dived myself in my sabbatical to reading a lot of uh physics chemistry because i just wanted to see that i don't want to get just intellectually uh blunt i think that's my biggest fear but so an anxiety so the i mean i'm going to reach i'm going to change the statement like the anxiety is not that what i'm going to leave for the kids the anxiety is always when you have kids are they going to turn up to be uh sort of self independent uh, being molded in the right way nobody gives you a book for parenting you every parent is winging on the way they like oh shit this is right this is wrong this is right this is wrong i think others are also kids that's why <laughs> there's <laughs> no manual for life out. and there's no manual for kids so on the personal side the anxiety is mostly when you have kids you like are we doing the right things and while you have a deluge of information online and everywhere your communities and everything you st- and you could be a helicopter parent you could be uh, like a completely detached parent uh, and both of those models have worked in very well in the world so you are not sure where you want to place yourself and this i think none of those models have worked out by the way what's worked out somewhere in the middle <laughs> we don't even know which part of the middle so in the professional life i think uh, i can talk about myself but i've also talked to a bunch of friends every entrepreneur uh, who has become successful or sold a company or two companies they have the sense of imposter syndrome shit was it luck or was it me then second time they go through it and they like so this is one is luck two is probably double luck three is probably pattern uh, i'm at two and every time you go through it you're like this is imposter syndrome and the anxiety comes from the fact hey what next what is the purpose of life where do i find significance and the human mind is trained like a monkey you are a part of a peer group which is the entire earth and the society and uh if uh and i'm, I'm going to connect it with the dna of the city if you are in a society where ideas are respected where what you are doing is respected you are sort of uh pushed into the motion of saying hey what next so most of the time when i meet people uh after selling the second one also like hey what next and 
earlier i would be like oh i'm doing this i'm doing that i'm doing that now become sort of more non insecure the reverse of insecure i'm like i just give a response i'm chilling the f- out right now because the pressure to say ki because right now i'm not very clear on what i'm going to do next while i'm doing a hundred other things on angel investments and all those things but from a point of view of building what next i have no f- idea right now do i want to build next absolutely sure but the journey to building an next is not like a process of saying hey here are five ideas you go pick one and go and build it's a journey for yourself to be able to figure out why do i want to build this idea and once you've done a couple of those your qualifiers become more and more bigger because you now you say hey either larger market size or something which has more again we're not going to use the word impact but maybe revenue opportunity and whole bunch of those things so your negation becomes higher but when you sort of then connect it back to what you built for the first company you said i was just tinkering kuch hua kuch hua usme company build uh, build ho gaye second one was somewhere in between so then you were sort of navigating between the aspect of hey earlier i was a tinkerer wahan se kuch nikla now i'm sort of looking like a mba guy trying to force fit yeah. into the market kahan par opportunity hai and the anxiety comes from that like which part of uh, that is you are you this mba guy trying to start looking at tap versus are you a tinkerer and this two conflict between the personalities creates anxiety and then when you uh, sort of uh, beat anybody and you say ki nahi pata kya karna people give you a blank stare now obviously i've gotten way better right now to be able to say nahi pata chill kar rahe so now when people ask i'm like i'm chilling the fuck out but internally you know ki ha you want to do something also you reach out to the right people for the help but this question of what are you doing next is what gives me anxiety i think i just want to build up on this just a slight tangent but for second time entrepreneurs um, it is difficult in a different way wherein i think they because more often than not they are financially f- free so they paint a very idealistic picture of what they want to build uh, almost like mba this is a large market opportunity will they would have a long plan step 1 step 2 step 3 and all that but most likely what works is what worked in their first case the tinkering at a problem and not knowing what will come out of it because if in a startup it's so obvious the opportunity how it's going to unfold somebody would already be doing it and startups are all read about tinkering something where there's a lot of uncertainty so it is a big trap with second for second time founders where they feel they figured it out but actually value is created when nobody is figured out you just have to waste your time tinkering to be able to unlock something of value so it is like oh shit my entire fund is dedicated on second time founders <laughs> now <laughs> ask them what what are they tinkering instead of asking them for business plan and never work out i think fear of failure are also there surprisingly no i mean i don't think i mean i'm doing it again as a second time founder um i mean it failure i mean there's obviously um let's say you give 10 years and it doesn't work out the way yeah that's totally fine because now like i said my source of joy is every day what am i learning and i also know given what i've seen my first startup there's so many random uh and lucky factors involved which are beyond my control that i don't think i would attribute both the success and the failure just to myself obviously there is part of what i do mattering but there's so many factors in terms of industry technology competition that i i don't think i would feel i have failed let's say if ninti has failed actually ninti i can give you an example why this going to be fun so actually this one even you don't know so i was hanging out with a friend in chandigarh but a friend from chandigarh had come to bangalore he came to know about an ninti about ninti because this his uh, friend who was a lady she was lost like a whole bunch of weight and she, he was like what the f- happened to you and she told him about ninti you pretty by probably know the guy i'm not saying it here and then do this is a really f- working she is one of your customer but even the ability to make an impact so in his case probably the impact is higher because you're basically changing a person's view of life and health and everything which is where uh, in a b2b i fundamentally believe wo utna possible nahi hai but in your case even if hypothetically the business fails but even if it changes like 10 lives for better where they extend their lives or whatever it is and 10 is a very small number i think you're working with a lot more with them uh, if i were him even if i change one life I still be very happy saying I made an impact in a real sense on somebody's human life even if the business fail I'm going to be happy with that yeah i mean so in in my like current setups people come up and say you know i feel much more healthier much more fitter 
and now the scope obviously is expanded from health coaching mm. to more or less you know personal growth coaching so people end up saying you know i feel less lonely i think that's a source of satisfaction in that sense uh obviously i wanted to be hugely commercially successful um but if that doesn't happen i won't attribute like i won't take failure personally i think i've learned my lesson from the first startup not to do that but if do you did you take any time uh, in fusion charts when things were going down failure personally in my case i have not experienced failure at a level where it would sort of kill the entire castle because fusion charts is the first company built that became non pasty successful in its own sense beach mein jo ventures kuch aaye the some of them succeeded didn't succeed but it was under the umbrella we have had couple of bad years we have had and our team getting fi- uh, sorry the team getting hired by somebody else so those are ups and downs but at a pure business level i don't think i've seen failure in the sense where i had to worry about ki kal payroll kaise aayega i had to worry about ki yaar uh, what am i really doing because even in the worst of the days i knew my entire engineering team is left hamre customers hai product ka request aa raha hai wo paise de rahe hain i have to figure out engineering team waise kaise banana so most of those were tactical uh, we have had a bunch of field products and i'm still very proud ki we started with thesis it did not work out we have had a whole field bunch of uh, my own internal decisions be it hr be it uh, culture side all of that none of those basically killed us in my case we just got very 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 lucky ki when i was 16 i started with one thing just went on and on obviously there's a lot of uh, in hindsight i can justify saying ki humne ye sahi kiya ye sahi kiya we did this right but i have not seen a colossal failure in that sense which would sort of put me down and i don't want to come out of my bed for like four weeks that i've not seen yet you see that i have like a relatively strong opinion on this when it comes to failure and startups i mean look where failure has got us we are talking about financial independence so failure in startups literally if you do again and again gets you financially independent and i think we should celebrate failure in startups because there is someone who's gone out and unlike almost everyone else in society try to venture into something which is completely unknown and obviously when you are getting into unknown i mean if something is very obvious success is obvious it's most likely going to be incremental but if something which is more likely than not to be failed i think we should celebrate it unless you are you can't just reward successes in a field uh, exclusively because successes and massive successes i think they come obviously they have a counterpoint of massive failures and failures in a practical sense really doesn't mean anything you end up learning so much building a startup that you will be much better off versus your peers who so are just to find the level of failure so for example like i know a couple of founders who uh, sold their house put all the money in the company in that case a failure is like financially disastrous for the family i, I don't think e- either of us of us have gone through that because we're playing safe i think one of the other things is when you are very early you can take a lot more risk this is like right now hypothetically if i didn't have any money at 40 and have to feed two kids and a wife and family my risk taking capability would be much lower so failure at this point would hurt a lot more versus when you were 18 because then you like yeah bhuke nangi to yaar parents ke sath rahenge yeah but i i, I mean in, even if i i don't know why anyone would sell their house to put in a in hell in she resignation conviction entrepreneurs conviction dude that is a that is that's, that's a job of vcs and lps for which this amount of money is just drop in the ocean uh, why would you put your own house on the line when because and he made it he paid freaking ball out of that out of i mean obviously i mean he could have but i'm saying really thinking i mean maybe it's a personal way of thinking but i would never risk putting my house uh for i mean it's sort of like putting your house for a lottery right startups are sure. it they're not exactly lottery but they have elements of lottery like things in there it's just betting then um and I betting with your own money to something which is inherently random is just i think i'll still do that yeah maybe because, the personality is different point. i mean i won't <laughs> risk getting on the streets mm. just because um, i have conviction in my startup so many other things matter when it comes to startups sure maybe now they matter to you more when you're 36 they might not have mattered to you when you were 22 because there was nothing to put into i mean <laughs> <laughs> living parents rent free getting meals for free i mean investment my investment when if i was literally 10 dollars for a server um uh, so what the domain yeah 200 bucks for domain now they're so expensive 200 ina yeah wow <laughs> <laughs> that was the investment literally so when when you say roi when you are early 
I think the ROI can be almost infinite because you're putting in so little. This has been a such a fantastic conversation. I yeah, it's been lovely. Know. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll do a second episode of this. <laughs> sure. Yeah. In ten years, once we get to learn more. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adad. Thank you so much, Adad, for hosting us. So pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.